more questions? Quick questions. Well, I made it really quick. One, two. We have had, no woman has asked a question, so I feel. <laughs> Why don't we start, please? Hi. Um, as you mentioned, Israel has recently become um, a place for uh, refugees from Darfur. Right. And actually, my parents just came back from an APAC mission trip to Israel, and they went to a school with um, child refugees who, um, it was a like, nonprofit organization. The Israeli families had taken in these children who had actually. They'd gone to Egypt, were sold into slavery, and came into Israel. And then right. my question is, um, an Israeli friend told me that this is actually kind of a controversial issue in Israel about how does Israel let in all these refugees from Darfur, all these Muslim refugees, but it's supposed to be a Jewish state. And I was just wondering what you have to say about that. All right, you. It's a, it's a, it's a, let me ask you the other question really quickly, then I'll ask them both, ask them both for a short amount of time. There's a gentleman right in front of you. Sir. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned in your speech that one of your top priorities as the ambassador in, in peace negotiations is the demilitarization of Palestine as a right. military threat. Um, I was wondering, my question was twofold. If, uh, a, you could expand a little bit on what specific provisions or, or what you would okay. be looking for in terms of that demilitarization, and B, um, in terms of the Palestinian response of whether that is negotiable at all or have you any problems on that. Excellent question. Both excellent questions. Good. 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 Excellent question. Um, the question of Darfur, it's not just that. Israel has the only open border between the Middle East and Africa. And it's not just in Darfur. We, uh, I, I'm actually even engaged in, in a conversation with the Obama administration. We're trying to learn from the Americans about immigration policy. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, it's, and what we've learned is uh, we've learned to divide immigrants into three different categories. There are political um, immigrants seeking asylum in Israel. And as victims of genocide ourselves, we cannot turn a blind eye, we cannot close our border to these people. There are people seeking um, political shelter from other regimes in Africa that are really <coughs> less than savory. And then there are economic immigration. And we've had a tremendous amount of economic and legal immigration across the board. Um, creating almost a different community in Israel of illegal immigrants. So we share a lot of the same challenges there. And so we're engaged in that type of dialogue. Darfur presents that particular problem of people who are fleeing genocide. And there's a vacant in Israel. Whether we can keep the border the border open indefinitely to this, to this flow. Um, these people travel across the desert. Many of them are killed. Many of them die. They take extreme risks. Um, and we are seeking a solution. I would be um, remiss and misleading to you if I knew if I knew I had the answer right now. All I'm telling you is the Israeli government right now is seized of this issue and struggling for an answer. Um, we don't quite, quite even have necessarily the, the social structure to even support this level of immigration to us. On the other hand, we recognize our, our duties. Israel has provided shelter for, to Vietnamese refugees. I mentioned earlier Bosnian refugees. Um, it's not just Jewish refugees from around the world. We recognize our historic and moral obligations here. Um, as for the demilitarization, <coughs> Israel has um, delineated several categories of demilitarization. For example, we do not want the Palestinian state to have an army that will have missiles that will fire into our neighborhoods and schools and cities the way the white missiles were fired from Gaza and Lebanon. We want the Palestinians to have a security force that will ensure their internal security, maintain law and order, very similar to the security forces that have now been uh, trained in conjunction with the United States Army and have proven very, very effective in restoring law and order to the Palestinian streets. We do not want the Palestinians to have an air force that can shoot down planes taking off and landing at our principal airport, which is only um, a few hundred yards from the West Bank. Um, we do not want the Palestinian state to have the ability uh, to sign treaties with hostile nations like Iran. Now, those of you who are studying, studying, your, Max, studying, studying, studying your Max Weber know that uh, sovereignty is defined as having the monopoly of a legitimate use of force. So the Palestinian state will not accord with the Weberian definition of a full sovereign state. Um, but there are many examples like this in the world. 
Germany and Japan after World War II also put tremendous restrictions on their use of, of military power, maintaining an army. There are many examples of like this, like this in the world. Um, Israel is also seeking, and this I, I did mention in my talk, a continued phased out military presence along the Jordan-Palestine um, border should the Palestinian state come into being. Uh, for the simple reason is that we have not had so much of a problem with our border with Gaza or our border with Lebanon. We've had a problem with Egypt's border with Gaza and Syria's border with Lebanon. Uh, and tens of thousands of missiles have been smuggled across those borders. And the presence of international uh, forces in Lebanon have proven uh, spectacularly ineffective in preventing uh, that type of smuggling. So Israel will seek to keep its forces on the border between Jordan and any future Palestinian state for a phased period of time. We'll be reviewed after five years and ten years and see how we're doing. Now, what do the Palestinians say about this? Well, as you can imagine, they're less enthused. But so far, in the context that we have had with the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian Authority, uh, they understand uh, that Israel has legitimate security concerns. They themselves do not want smuggling of rockets and munitions to Hamas cells in the West Bank, which would pose a mortal threat to the Palestinian Authority. And they understand that there are going to have to be special security arrangements. Um, again, the main thing is that we sit down and talk to one another. And right now, we have not proven a success in getting the Palestinians to sit and talk with us. And we hope the United States and Israel are working very assiduously, very industriously right now to try to create a situation where we can get back to negotiation and we can begin to discuss all of these difficult questions, security, borders, refugees, Jerusalem, all of them on the table. We are committed to seeing it through and we look forward to that day when, yes, there can be uh, two states living side by side and I stress permanent and legitimate peace and we look forward to better time the Middle East in general. I want to thank you, uh, Emery, for having uh, for hosting me so graciously. Thank you, Vice President Hawk, Professor Stein. Um, it's been a great experience. Uh, not every campus has been uh, so civil, and I hope that uh, you feel, as I do, that I'm coming away from this uh, enriched and better informed. Thank you very much. <laughs>